last meeting of the Colton Joe Unified School District Board of Education, December 16th, uh, 2021, last meeting of the calendar year. Um, we'll begin by uh, having a roll call uh, by Ms. Medina, if you'd please roll call of board members present. Ms. Torino. Ms. Torino Heda. Mrs. Haro. Mr. Ibarra. Here. Ms. Sandoval. Here. Mr. Fuentes. Here. Mrs. Adige. Here. Mr. Flores. Here. Thank you for that, Ms. Medina. And we'll begin as we do uh, each meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance. I am going to, I know she's working away diligently with Ms. Katie Orloff, our Communications Director. Would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you for that. We do have uh, Spanish language interpretive services available for our meeting for both those that would like assistance in interpretation for listening to the meeting as well as any public comment they may have. Uh, this evening we have with us Ms. Cynthia Bueno to please provide our interpretive services. Mrs. Bueno. Thank you, Mr. Flores. Good evening all. My name is Cynthia Bueno. I'm a translator receptionist for the district. And tonight I, I will be able to offer uh, interpreting services. If anybody needs to, please uh, reach out for me in the back. Muy buenas noches a todos. Yo me llamo Cynthia Bueno, soy traductora y recepcionista del distrito. Y mi propósito para esta noche es servir, ofrecer servicios de interpretación. Si alguien desea, me encuentro en la mesa trasera. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you for that, Mrs. Bueno. Uh, before we continue with the items on the agenda, I do have an order of business to make an announcement uh, as the president. Uh, as many of you know, the state of California yesterday announced a renewed uh, mask mandate issued by the California Department of Public Health. Uh, this mandate is in effect statewide, uh, and it does ap apply to all uh, indoor public spaces, of which obviously we are. This is a public meeting. So uh, just a reminder to everybody that's in the meeting today, you must wear a mask uh, while you're in the meeting. Um, we would ask that you please comply. Again, this is something that's being um, issued by the California Department of Public Health, certainly not the school district, but we have to comply being that we are a public agency and holding a public meeting. So again, uh, just a gentle reminder to please wear your mask. If, if you're not, uh, you may be reminded uh, to do so. We do have masks available. If you did not bring one, we have disposable masks in the back. Um, and again, those are be available uh, should anybody need one, but please, we would just kindly ask for your uh, compliance in wearing a mask this evening. So. I'm sorry. You know, at this juncture, we will we'll have to say no. I know it's difficult and I apologize and we're speaking through them as well. What we'll do is make sure that that microphone is right at your mouth level and we can hear, we are able to hear. So uh, I know it's a little bit of a challenge because we have to do it as well, but I would ask that you please keep your mask on um, while speaking. Thank you for that. Okay, our uh, first item uh, for business is item 1.3, the adoption of our December 16th agenda. There is a requested amendment to closed session item 10.4. Uh, it's our personal public employee uh, appointment item. The addition of one volunteer coach for boys soccer and the addition of four volunteers, one for Grant, one for Lincoln Elementary and two for McKinley. I'll ask if there is a motion to adopt those amendments. Oh, I have a motion by board member Hara. I'll, I'll second. second by uh, board member Ibarra. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, uh, it is approved unanimously. Thank you. Okay, uh, today is a uh, special meeting in that this is our reorganization uh, meeting. So items 2.0 uh, include all of our reorganization items uh, for this evening. This includes the selection of officers as well as appointments from our board of education to various uh, other boards, ROP, um, the county uh, office on uh, County Committee on Reorganization. So uh, what I will do is I'll go and conduct the election, if you will, of all of those appointments, um, including the selection of meeting dates and times. And once we conclude that process, I will be I will be happy to hand off the gavel to our <laughs> next president. Um, and, and on that note, and this is just, uh, 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 I just wanted to take a moment to thank my colleagues for the opportunity and the privilege to be able to serve as president this last year. It's uh, something that, uh, 
it's not a not an easy task, but it's something that I certainly enjoyed, and I just appreciate the trust that you placed in me to do so. So thank you for that. I truly appreciate it. Uh, but having said that, we will go ahead and jump right into the selection of officers for uh, this evening's meeting. The first one being um, the president. And again, just a reminder to board members, uh, the process is such that I will open the nomination floor for nominations. Any board member may make, make a nomination. Um, there would be a second, needs to be a second for that nomination. Of course, the nominee would need to consent. They'd like to, they would have to accept. Uh, we don't wanna make anybody serve in a position. I mean, I guess we could, but we would probably not prefer to have people serve in a position they would not want to. Uh, once we have all the nominations on the floor, one or more, we will then go through the process of voting to select who the next officer will be. So beginning with the uh, position of board president, I will go ahead at this time, open the floor for nominations. Uh, I would be happy, again, as a board president to nominate the, as we have, as is tradition, if you will, um, and I think one that holds merit, to nominate our vice president, who has uh, many times been in many of the meetings and has been working hard uh, at the agenda itself and uh, becoming familiar with it. So I'd be more than happy to nominate Ms. Berthadegin if she would accept. Would you, would you accept the nom Well, is there a second? I'll ask you. <laughs> okay. Is there, a, do, you, do you accept the nomination? I accept. Okay. Uh, any other nominee, uh, nominations for board president? All right, well, hearing none, I will close the nomination period. So uh, we do have a nomination uh, and a second of that nomination. Um, in essence, that is the vote, or excuse me, the motion, the motion to appoint uh, board member Adeguin. So I will place that in the form of a motion uh, to appoint board member Adeguin the president for the school board uh, for the coming 2022 year. Uh, Mr. Fuentes, uh, you, do you second that motion? All right. Any other questions? If not, we will go ahead and call for a vote. So I will ask all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, it is so ordered. Congratulations, Ms. Adeguin. All right, the next office uh, for appointment, for election, if you will, is the Office of Vice President for the 2022 school year, uh, excuse me, calendar year. I will open the floor for nominations. I will second. Okay. Nomination is second. Ms. Lorraine Ojeda, do you accept that uh, yes, nomination? Wonderful. Any other nominations on the floor? All right, hearing none, we'll go ahead and close the nomination for vice president. We have a nomination, so I'll simply ask uh, if that would be in the form of, of a motion. Ms. Haro? Um, I nominate. Um, move to appoint. I'm moving, yes, move to appoint. Um, <coughs> board member, go right here to the office of vice president. Is that? And I second. Twenty-two school uh, calendar year. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, it is so ordered and approved unanimously. Congratulations, Ms. Lorraine Ojeda. Uh, the next office for election is the Office of Clerk. I will at this time open the floor for nominations. Uh, I'd be happy at this juncture to nominate uh, Mr. Fuentes, if he would be so inclined for the uh, position of clerk. I, I will second. Mr. Fuentes, would you accept that nomination? Yes, I accept. Any other nominations for I'd, clerk? I'd like to nominate Board Member Ibarra. Okay, Board Member Ibarra. Is there a second? Like, really, we should be asking if there's an acceptance of the nomination. Mr. Barra, but is there, <laughs> would you, would you like to accept the nomination? Uh, okay, is there a second? All right. Uh, any other nominations? Okay, hearing none, we will close nominations. So uh, just in keeping with the um, process, uh, typically what we'll do is then we'll have a vote when we have multiple nominations on the floor. You have to have a majority of the board members, obviously. So 
uh, we can address those in order, uh, Ms. Medina, if that's appropriate. And then uh, if there is, uh, whoever ultimately has the majority of the votes will be, will be selected for the position. So since Mr. Fuentes was um, nominated, uh, first we'll go ahead and take a vote on that. And at this time, uh, again, we'll ask for it in the form of a, uh, of a motion. Uh, I made that nomination, so I will make that in the form of a motion that we appoint Mr. Um, Fuentes clerk for the 22 calendar year. And I'll second. Second that, okay. So I'll ask for a um, vote at this time. Uh, in fact, let's do a roll call vote if that would be appropriate, Ms. Dean, if you would mind. Ms. Doreen Ojeda. Mrs. Harrop? No. Mr. Ibarra? No. Mr. Flores? Uh, yes. Ms. Adegui? Mrs. Sandoval? Mr. Fuentes. You, you can vote yes or abstain, it's up to you, but it would not be inappropriate to vote yes if you would like. Abstain, okay. So I believe that motion fails, correct, Ms. Mia? Okay, not a problem. So we'll go to the next nomination on the floor. Um, is there a motion uh, to appoint Mr. Uh, Ibarra, clerk? To nominate Mr. Ibarra as the uh, 2022 clerk. Okay, is there a second? Second by Board Member Thorin Ojeda. Thank you for that. So again, we'll ask for a roll call vote, Ms. Medina. Ms. Thorin Ojeda. Yes. Mrs. Haro. Mr. Ibarra. Yes. Yes. Mr. Flores. Yes. Ms. Adegui. Mr. Fuentes. Mrs. Sandoval. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, motion is approved. So, uh, Mr. Barr, congratulations for being our clerk for the 2022. You've, you've had that a few times, I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> the next office for appointment is a uh, two year term to the ROP um, board, which we are a member of. This is for 22 through 23, since it is a two year term. Um, and so I believe at this time, the seat, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, the seat currently held by Mrs. Haro. Uh, and so I will open the floor for nominations for the appointment to the ROP board. I'd like to nominate that vote. Uh, I will second that, certainly. Uh, Ms. Haro, would you accept that nomination? Any other nominations? All right, hearing none, we'll go ahead and close the nomination period. I'll ask Mr. Barr if you wouldn't mind putting that in the form of a motion. Okay, uh, I'd like to nominate Pat Haro as uh, ROP uh, representative. Okay. And I am happy to second that. So we've got a motion and a second to appoint Ms. Haro to the ROP board for a two-year term. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Okay, one abstention. With, uh, so it is approved with Ms. Haro abstaining. All right. Uh, the next item is our ROP board member alternate. Uh, currently, I believe Mr. Fuentes uh, is the alternate for our board. And again, this is for the 2022 uh, calendar year. Uh, at this time, I'll open the floor for nominations. I'd like to nominate Israel. All right, thank you for that. Uh, I'm happy to second that nomination. Mr. Fuentes, do you accept? All right, any other nominations? Hearing none, we'll close the nomination period and simply ask that Mr. Barr that you place that in the form of a vote to appoint Mr. Fuentes to the seat. Yes, I'd like to nominate uh, Israel Fuentes. All right, happy uh, to. Oh, 2022 sorry. ROP board uh, alternate for ROP. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll second that. Uh, we have a motion and a second to appoint Mr. Fuentes to the alternate ROP board seat. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any, <laughs> any abstention, or excuse me, any uh, dissenting, any no's? None, any abstentions? One abstention, okay, Mr. Fuentes will abstain. So that is approved with Mr. Fuentes abstaining. Okay, next is the, uh, 
This is the representative for the San Mario County Committee of School District Organization. Uh, and again, this is for the 22 calendar year. Um, Ms. Florian Ojeda currently uh, fills this role, and I will <coughs> open the floor now for nomination. I'd like to nominate Ms. Florian Ojeda, please. Is there a second to that nomination? Okay, certainly. Ms. Florian Ojeda, would you accept? All right. Any other nominations? All right. Hearing none, we'll go ahead and close the nomination period. And uh, simply ask that we have a motion to appoint Ms. Uh, Thorin Ojeda to the um, Committee on School District Reorganization. Down. I think that was Ms. Hara, was it, the, the motion? Yes. Okay. So we have, is there, and the second, I think, was Mr. Barr. Okay. We have a motion and a second to appoint Ms. Thorin Ojeda. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, it is approved unanimously. And that concludes all of the appointments that we have for the various seats and offices officers for the board. Next on the agenda is selection of our uh, regular meeting dates for the coming calendar year. Uh, you see in the agenda itself, we have the proposed dates uh, following the similar pattern that we have, two meetings a month, with the exception of months where school may be out of session due to a holiday. So um, at this time, I'll ask if there is a motion to approve the recommended dates for the 22 calendar year. Motion approved. Do we have a second? Second. Any questions or comments about the uh, proposed calendar? All right. Hearing none, uh, we will. I will ask uh, all those in favor to say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Hearing none, they are approved as recommended. And the last reorganization item we have is the meeting start time. Um, we have in the agenda three proposed meeting start times, as we typically do, 5 p.m., 5.30 p.m. and 6 p.m. Um, so what I will ask for is if there is a motion to select one of those times, uh, and we'll start uh, with that. So I'll open the floor if there is a motion, motion to approve. To motion to select. B. Okay, we have a, a motion, we'll say motion by Board Member Haro, second by Board Member Fuentes for option B, which is the 5.30 or current start time. Any questions, comments, uh, thoughts on that? All right, hearing none, we will then, um, I will ask for a vote. So all those in favor of selecting option B, the 5.30 start time, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, it is so ordered. All right, I think that does it for me. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Ms. Medina, we're gonna go ahead and just take a brief pause to reorganize uh, ourselves, and then we'll jump back into the meeting. So again, I appreciate the opportunity to serve as your president, and I am happy to pass the gavel off to Ms. Uh, Board President Bertha Adeguin. Looks like everybody else is staying put. Yeah? Okay. For now. For now. <laughs> Thank you. It is indeed a pleasure to serve as your president for this new for this new coming school year. I would like the, to take a, a moment to thank President Flores for his leadership. Mr. Flores, we appreciate all you have done. You've done so much for um, for our students, for our community, 
Thank you for your dedication and your service, especially during these unprecedented times. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are moving on to 3.0 public hearing. I would like to invite CSEA representative to read out the Sunshine Articles. Good evening, Board President Flores, or I'm sorry, excuse me, Board President Adegin, Board Members, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and members of the audience. My name is Anthony Guadarrama, and I'm the lead negotiator for CSEA Chapter 244, and I was just recently elected as the Chapter President, so I'll start that role January 1st. So. I look forward to working with everyone. Tonight, I'm going to be presenting the 2021-2022 Reopen or Negotiation Sunshine Proposal. <clears throat> the California School Employees Association and its Chapter 244 present our initial proposal to negotiate 2021-2022 reopeners. CSEA desires to alter and or amend the following articles as intended and presents our proposal for public discussion in accordance with Government Code 3547 as follows. Article 4, Grievances. CSEA will propose language to increase the current amount of association release time. Article 6, Compensation. CSEA will propose language to attract and retain the best qualified professional classified staff by improving the existing salary structure. Provide COLA to all bargaining unit members based on the 2021-2022 California State Budget and other funds available to the district. Include the new duty classification on the salary schedule and provide additional funding for the classified professional growth program. Article 7, Salary class Classification. CSEA will propose language to update and clarify the process of reviewing, reviewing job classifications and update the reclassification process. Article 8, Health and Welfare Benefits. CSEA will propose language to enhance the health and welfare benefits of bargaining unit members corresponding with the district's ability to pay. Article 10, Assignments. CSEA will propose language to formally add CSEA members to interview panels. And Article 14, Holidays. CSEA will propose language to enhance the holidays offered to bargaining unit members. Thank you. Thank you for that. I will now close this public hearing. <coughs> Item 3.2, Colton Joint Unified School District Sunshine for Colton School Employees Association. I will now open this for public hearing. Mr. Ortiz, Dr. Ortiz, I'm sorry. Good evening, Board President Aragin, Board Members, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and members of the audience. Uh, Anthony Ortiz, Director of Human Resources. The Colton Joint Unified School District submits the following initial proposal for 2021-2022 reopeners to the collective bargaining agreement with the California School Employees Association. The district is interested in bargaining the following articles. Article 6, Compensation. Article 8, Health and Welfare Benefits and Related Appendices. Article 12, Leave Provisions. Article 17, Disciplinary Action and Dismissal. This list is not exhaustive and the district reserves the right to make additional proposals as negotiations progress. Additional subjects of meeting and negotiating arising after the presentation of this initial proposal shall be made public within 24 hours pursuant to Government Code 3547, Letter D. The district is also reviewing uh, all other provisions of the collective bargaining agreement for the 2021-2022 school year. Thank you, Dr. Ortiz. Okay, we're clo closing the public comment this public hearing. Moving on to 4.0, public comments. We have cards in the back for those of uh, you in the public who would like to speak. We have appropriate pu public comment cards that need to be filled out. You can fill them out and then pass them over to Ms. Uh, Joanne Medina. Okay, we're gonna invite each speaker to the podium and should begin by stating his or, or her name and reciting city.
Okay, we will allow, um, we're allowed three minutes per speaker. And um, this will be to address the board on each agenda or non-agenda item. The board shall limit the total time for public input on each item for, to 15 minutes. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public presentation, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to be heard. The president may take a poll of speakers for or against a particular issue and may ask the additional persons to speak only if they have something else to add. So with that, we're gonna be inviting our first speaker, Christy Bull. Good evening, my name is Christy Bull. Uh, oops. I reside in Grand Terrace, California. I have uh, three students currently in the district who are seniors at Grand Terrace High School, one eighth grader at Terrace Hills Middle School. Does that mean my time started when it's yellow? I'm okay? Okay. Yeah, you're at two minutes and 37. Oh, I'm going, okay. Good evening, school board and superintendent Miranda. I won't pour my heart out this time as our pleas have fallen on deaf ears. There seems to be no compassion from those that sit in front of us. I prefer to use my time to share some important thoughts and rhetorical questions for the recorded minutes. One, do you remember that when you took this trusted position, you swore an oath to op uphold the constitution? Do you realize that a mandate is not a law? Do you realize the district you have been entrusted to oversee is spreading division and discrimination of the vaccinated and unvaccinated? Do you realize that parents, teachers, students, community members in red shirts here today are in support of medical freedom? And this is only but a very small fraction of people that you are disregarding with your obvious lack of support. You have yet to pull parents to find out who actually wants to vaccinate and who refuses to give it to their children. Uh, give this vaccine to their children due to it being a drug with many harmful and sometimes fatal outcomes. We've done the research. You have shown zero motivation in being proactive for those that sit in front of you. Have you researched the medical liabilities that will fall upon our district when a student falls sick from CJUSD forcing them to vaccinate a child without knowing their medical history? Do you realize the harm that will come to our students once again, forcing them to return to a distant learning situation and isolating them from their peers and natural learning environment. We learned how very detrimental it is on children, mentally, physically, emotionally, and educationally from the last bout of keeping school doors closed way longer than necessary. Those issues are on you, and you threaten to do it all over again for those that choose not to vaccinate. Bottom line is we teach our kids to be leaders, but our district leaders in front of me today are followers, sadly. We teach our kids to be proactive. Their district leaders are reactive and won't even do the research of how this vaccine will harm our kids. You refuse to see the evidence that has been brought in front of you at each of these meetings. Perhaps you can change these negative views tonight when you go into closed session and discuss the resolution we provided to you. You can show us you care by placing a resolution on the next agenda to show us your commitment to upholding your oath of office. If you refuse to stand and protect our children in your district or refuse to treat our children equally, you are simply followers in the education system. We expect you to be leaders and fight with us and for us. Your actions or your silence will speak volumes. What you choose tonight will let us know exactly where you stand. Thank you. I sincerely hope you will make us proud. Next, next speaker, we have Rhonda Fagan. And we started this district, everyone has fired me supposedly uh, on the 9th. I haven't looked at my mail, but they fired me officially today. Let me tell you right now, I'm, I don't 
fancy pants, I'm going to call it out if you don't mind. Well, I see the snake sitting here. We've got the head viper here as Dr. Miranda. I tried to see him today, you guys. He did nothing, superintendent. He will not do anything. I see his co-viper over here, Mr. Garcia, and I see Dr. Ortiz here. They're all running a racket together, and they're running in, co in concert, you guys, and they're not going to do anything. They fired me officially because of the vaccine and, and the religious discrimination, which I'm going to cross through them at EELC, and they're going to see the fire that I'm going to bring down because I'm going to bring it down in the state. Remember that. Remember me that you started of this, Dr. Miranda, I came to you today. I'm, everyone knows I'm a devout Christian, but I came to you today to do something because these two didn't do anything. And all of you guys are like monkey see, monkey do. Sitting here listening to these board members, they're probably nice people. They don't know what you're not doing over at the uh, district. By the way, I'm sorry, Rhonda Fagan, <laughs> you look me up on Facebook, um, there's like six Caucasian Rhonda Fagans, and then there's one black one. So if you want to email me on Facebook, I'll be happy to take your message. But thank you so much for standing up about the vaccines because these people are foolish. And if you take that vaccine, that's on you. But the rest of us who don't want to take it, and we have a medical or religious exemption, we have protected rights, and it's going to be my pleasure if the EEOC of Los Angeles, and if I have to talk to people at Washington DC EEOC, I will, against these three in this district. I will take this district down by your name starting tomorrow with everything I've got. And I tell you as a devout Christian, you know, just people like, oh, Rhonda, God is good, and he is good, he is holy. But if you mess with God's children, if you look at the Bible and people who mess with the children of Israel, Edomites, Jebusites, Hittites, God told the children of Israel, stand up, fight them, knock them out, murder them in my name, my authority, because I'm God. So you watch out. How much more time I got? Because I, I know of one minute and 17 seconds. Let me let it go. See, everybody, I, that was only agenda item number one. Let's see if we can one through seven. Okay, religious exemption, I talked about that. I was terminated, talked about that. Uh, Mr. Miranda, Dr. Miranda being a snake, talked about that. He's totally insufficient and incompetent. Oh, I put words here like he fails. His motives are questionable. He lacks all kind of ethics. Okay, let's go forward. I guess you guys know that already. I was assaulted at Washington Alternative High School, my first or second high school. He should have asked me that today, but he didn't even care. I had a student named Matthew almost hyphen I have his last name, I'll call him Matthew, threw something, a projectile in my face. I told him to stop doing it and it could have injured me. He threw it a minute later, so I had something thrown at me twice. I could have gone to the hospital, God knows what could have happened to me. This district, when I left, Mr. Torres, the principal did nothing. I wrote a referral, this district doesn't care. Second thing about a student, I was at Colton High School, I had a Hispanic male student, I have his first name, I think it's Gabriel, and he went to the office and lied and said something I didn't say. I had two witnesses, two student witnesses that I have for record for the board. They, uh, they, uh, I said I didn't say it 50, 50 seconds. Anyways, um, they side blocked me from Colton, and I have several issues at Bloomington High School. Maybe I have to come back in January and I'll continue them. This district is dirty, they stink, they got snakes and pit vipers, and I'm glad to hear you guys talk about the vaccine. Um, Rhonda Fagan, I'm so sorry I ran out of time because I was just bowled over by this. The payroll issues, all kinds of issues. I'll be here next Bill Hussey. I'll be here next month. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to speak loudly. I'm sorry. This is unconventional. Dr. Miranda, can you, there's a, a concern about personnel naming students uh, with accusations. These are minors. Can we get some clarification on whether that is appropriate or not? Absolutely. Thank you, Board President, for that. Uh, it is not appropriate to name uh, students. Uh, these are minors. So advise uh, uh, anybody speaking, public speaking, uh, comments to not uh, mention any minors. We need to protect uh, uh, the confidentiality piece. And so you can be held liable for that. So just would appreciate that and, and remind uh, the rest of public comments. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, board members, uh, Dr. Miranda, public. My name is Bill Hussey, City of Grand Terrace, also on the City Council there, but I didn't come here to push my way. I just came here because I had parents that are concerned about the, the state mandate that's coming down for their children for being vaccinated and non-vaccinated. And, you know, um, I'm not going to get hot-headed or anything. Um, this is a passion to me, and I know every one of you board members um, I know your heart I know why you're up there and I know decisions can be tough but we also you guys were board members because you made a stand and I know your history on the stands that you made instead of what's right 
I know a lot of things can come down, you know, this all becomes legal issues. And I think the only ones that, you know, the lawyers are making money out of this because that's how it goes. That's how it goes in our city. But my thing is respect, respect for the parents that vaccinate their kids and respect for the parents that don't vaccinate their kids. It's their choice. You know, mothers, fathers, they want to protect their children. Um, this reminds me, and Christine did a beautiful job about uh, discrimination. You know, I'm 57 and I've seen it. I remember hearing the stories about it with my grandmothers about, you know, the white and the black, you know, um, drinking fountains, the classroom discrimination. This is what it's going down to. And it's been sad to see, you know, do we want, do I want my grandchildren to talk about discrimination, how they were separated into another class because they weren't vaccinated from their friends that were vaccinated, which the children have no choice. It's the parents' choice for their children. So th that's really sad. Um, bullying, you know, are they gonna start bullying people because they're vaccinated, not vaccinated? I mean, it leads to the whole Pandora box. And when we talk about, I was in the Marine Corps for nine years and you know, you pretty much got your shots, but I know a lot of friends who got the anthrax shot during the Gulf War and a, not a very good outcome after that shot vaccine. My father, who was a Vietnam vet, suffered from Agent Orange, died at 47 because he was told by the government that the Agent Orange won't kill you. And it went to his bloodstream and killed him slowly for 20 years. So, um, you know, I, I know it's, it's a closed session probably for, so it's not agenda. I, I will be back here when it's on agenda item. I have a different speech for that. But right now, I'm just asking you guys to have an open heart, which I know you will. Please, and think about everybody's rights. Think about the parents' rights, the scary time this COVID was. But um, let's, you know, it's kind of hard with their leadership that we have in the state. I mean, they go out to dinner when everybody else couldn't. They go get a haircut when everybody else couldn't. It's kind of hard, you know, when the state mandated these masks and when the all care came out, the virus in San Francisco, they got a waiver. So I don't understand. It's crazy. But anyway, I know I just want to say thank you and just, you know, use your heart and God bless and Merry Christmas, everybody. Bill Todd. Bill Todd Riverside, I teach at Colton. I've spent 100 plus hours over the last 18 months listening to doctors and other highly trained professionals regarding COVID. And I want you to know what I know. So I prepared some printed material, which has articles and links to some videos I've watched. To save you time, I've spent close to 20 hours of my time, time stamping, summarizing, and further highlighting the most important points. It's my hope that you will spend some of your time reading, watching, and listening to what I have to offer today. For those who want a shorter story, it's this. Healthy people under 20 years of age have a statistically zero chance of dying of COVID, even with no treatment. When they recover, they have a lifelong immunity that will be helpful against any of the new variants. There are hope to overcome this. If, however, they vaccinate, all bets are off. Vaccination immunity is inferior, it's non-sterilizing, and gives almost no protection against new variants like Delta is proving right now. Vaccination doesn't prevent disease nor transmission. Furthermore, there are dangerous side effects to vaccinating. Pregnant women are experiencing stillbirths at over 50 times the norm. I could go on about side effects, but I think it's more important to relay what happened to one of my vaccinated students in my class about two weeks ago. The student was standing over my right shoulder. We were discussing some work. One second, the student was speaking normally and was completely coherent. Not 30 seconds later, this student came crashing face down on my desk and was completely unresponsive. EMTs were called, the vitals were all unremarkable, except a rapid pulse rate. Loss of consciousness and rapid heart rate are both symptoms of myocarditis. Myocarditis is one of the known side effects of these vaccines and is particularly affecting young people. And just in case you think this is a one-off, another teacher on my hallway had a similar thing happen to one of her students recently. The student was totally unconscious. If all of our students become vaccinated, we could be seeing a lot more of these incidents. Before you vote for mandating a vaccination for these children, think of these kids. 
Do you know the long-term health consequences? I don't. Nobody does. The long-term consequences of this new experimental mRNA gene therapy, colloquially called a vaccine, are completely unknown. No long-term studies have ever been done. They're doing them right now on us. That's crazy. I don't know about you, but I choose to remain in the control group. If I were in your position, if I were in your position and voted for the mandate and even one of our students was seriously hurt from these vaccines, which is more than statistically die from COVID, I would feel terribly guilty. That's why I would choose freedom over mandates. With freedom, only we hold the responsibility for our choices. In my opinion, maintaining freedom of choice is the safest and most moral position to take. Thank you. Good evening, board member Edergeen, members of the board and superintendent Miranda. My name is Chastity Kotze from Grand Terrace, California. Thank you, Dr. Miranda, for meeting with us yesterday. Though we hope for the resolution to be an action item on today's agenda, we have some clarity as to why you have chosen to dis discuss it in closed session. I can only imagine you have your own justification for choosing not to publicly discuss this matter. However, we as a community still ask you to, to consider taking a positional stance for medical freedom and hope that you would move forward with putting the re resolution on January's agenda. I would like to reiterate that we understand that a positional stance would not supersede the law, but at least we would know you support us. If <clears throat> for whatever reason you are unable to stand with us, we ask that you would start working toward a program that supports your unvaccinated community. We need a program that will stop discriminating and compromising the success of the unvaccinated students, staff, and teachers. Today is a sad day. Today marks the last day for multiple students here at CJUSD. Some of these families have been a part of CJUSD for multiple generations. Choosing to remain silent has consequences. Parents are being forced to be proactive and ultimately have chosen to pull their students from the district today. There is forever and will forever be a rippling effect. Thank you. Stephanie Light. Good evening. My name is Stephanie Light and I reside in Grand Terrace. I would like to start by mentioning my educational and professional history. I have a bachelor's in biology pre-med. Sorry, my family's here and it's making me a little. <laughs> so, um, and a master's in health science with a public health concentration. I have worked in both healthcare and pharmaceutical fields, including working with the FDA on new product approval. Having worked in a pharmaceutical environment with a company seeking FDA approval of new products, it took years for approval. The rate that this COVID this COVID vaccine has been approved is alarming. While we have been told it is safe and effective, there is absolutely no way for that to be known due to the extremely short time frame this vaccine has been studied. There has not been enough time to determine the long-term impacts of this vaccine, one major reason why it should not be required for students to attend CJUSD schools. The most recent data on the CDC's Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System from December 3rd for all COVID vaccines states that 681,962 different types of adverse reactions have been reported, with 2,925,804 individual cases reported of these adverse reactions. Reactions include respiratory complications, cardiac issues, seizures, and death. No person, especially a child, should be placed in a position where they have to face these types of medical crises to attend school. The American Heart Association published an article on December 6th stating that while, myo myocardar sorry, while myocarditis, the inflammation of cardiac muscles, may be rare among children who have received the COVID vaccine. 
I directly quote the article stating, more research is needed to understand whether there are long-term cardiac effects of COVID-19 vaccine-associated myocarditis. Myocarditis is a serious medical condition and our children should not be forced to risk this well-known vaccine adverse reaction and its unknown long-term impacts in order to attend school. There is an abundance of verifiable scientific information available that proves the risks of this vaccine and also indicates it's not, it is not as effective as promised. Due to the time limit, I cannot include them. However, I hope you do thorough research on this prior to voting. I ask you as our board members, the representatives of our community, that you hear our community's request. I ask that you make the ethical and moral decision to allow parents to make their own decisions regarding their child, whether or not they vaccinate. I implore you to be brave and vote against enforcing this COVID vaccine mandate in our schools. Where there is risk, there must be choice. Thank you. Kevin, Kevin Knight. Uh, my name is Kevin Light. I uh, live in Grand Terrace. Um, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm just gonna start by saying when you guys had the kids wearing masks, but I could go to a restaurant and go sit at a table without my mask, that was ridiculous. But I just, I just kept it to myself. And now we're talking about putting injections into our kids. It's an experiment. We don't know what's gonna happen. And if somebody wants to choose to put it in them or in their kids, that's their freedom of choice. But we should also have the freedom of choice to not put it into our bodies. I'm gonna read an excerpt from the Nuremberg Code. And it says, the voluntary consent of the human subject is absolutely essential. This means that the person involved should have legal capacity to give consent, should be so situated as to be able to exercise free power of choice without the intervention of any element of force, fraud, deceit, duress, overreaching, or other ulterior form of constraint or coercion, and should have sufficient knowledge and comprehension of the elements of the subject matter involved as to enable him to make an understanding and enlightened decision. So, as far as my child goes, we will not be in this district any longer if you move forward with this. And I argue that it's unfortunate that there's not many parents that can do that because the way the system is designed, so in the event that parents don't have the choice to pull their kids from your school, if you choose to do this, and something, God forbid, happens to these children, if it were I, every single one of your names would be on the lawsuit. Because it, you guys, I hope that uh, so many kids can get pulled from this school if their parents don't want to do it. And they're not forced or coerced because that's what this is. You're basically saying if your kid wants to go to school here, you got to jab them. And that's ridiculous. You know, we love our school, we love our city, and we love our kids. And at the beginning of this, we pledged allegiance to the flag. And that's all well and fine, but why don't we pledge allegiance to our kids? Because that's what matters. So God forbid if bodies fall on your campuses of your kids that you may do this, you all should be in the gallows with them. Um, I have a uh, Kate in town. I'll, I apologize if I mispronounce. Should I wait until the end of that timer? Okay. I'm not talking about that. Okay. <laughs> All right, so good evening. My name is Caitlin Town and I'm a math teacher at Joe Baca Middle School. I would like to start off by saying how thankful I am to work at my school and how appreciative I am of my students and my colleagues. We have all just made it through an unprecedented first semester. I am here to tell you how disappointed and frustrated I am with this district's um, leadership. Dr. Mooney, Dr. Jimenez, Dr. Peterson, Dr. Miranda, you have not listened to the teachers this semester. You do not understand what we've been through these past 20 weeks with our students and that many of us have felt like we are drowning. This whole semester has been the most challenging and stressful time in my teaching career. Not only do we have to, we have to deal with back to back, um, oh my goodness, I'm sorry. 
dealing with coming back to campus for the first time in a year and a half, but also an almost endless stream of emails, including covert exposure notifications, almost daily requests to sub on our preps, a rotating door of students almost due to quarantine. Um, we have had so many mental health concerns with students feeling anxious, depressed, or just worried to be back among so many people again. And on top of all of these new challenges, we have been required to administer the NWEA MAPS assessment, which has already taken away more than two full weeks of instruction this semester. MAPS was never voted on in Curriculum Council. It was only presented as an informational item. And at a later meeting, the teachers in Curriculum Council asked Ed Services with Dr. Jimenez and Dr. Mooney for the dates to be moved to January so that we were not taking the test and finals back to back. Not the only response given was that we had to start maps in September because we had the eight SEL days in the beginning of the year and we didn't want to test kids in August, which I agree with. My problem with this is that the maps program should not be allowed to dictate our testing intervals. Our district should not be paying a company and then using their required testing timeline. Um, the teachers were told that this would only take one 90 minute session per test and there are four tests altogether. But in reality, this semester, we have taken over two weeks of instructional time to administer this test, and we still have one more round to go in April. I would also like to remind the district and school board that the only required tests are the state test and finals, which only adds to my frustration about the MAPS testing. If my testimony is not enough, please allow me to read a few of my students at JBMS's testimony. Um, I feel bothered because we have no time in between the MAPS test and finals testing. I also feel like I will be overwhelmed because we have no, we have nonstop testing in December. I feel like it's too much to do in a month. It's getting in the way of our finals prep and having to go from one important test to another the next week seems stressful. It's two weeks of testing, which gets exhausting. I can't help but feel not only overwhelmed, but overlooked and not heard. They just decided to do it at the worst time possible without even taking only the teachers, but the students into consideration. If our district wants to use a hashtag like CJUSD cares, then the people in charge at the district office need to start living by that mantra. This, this concludes public comment. Moving on to 5.0 administrative presentations. Item 5.1, first interim report and LCAP budget overview for parents, business service division, and educational service division. I would like to invite Assistant Superintendent Tina Dagno and Director Maria Manda Sarabia to present. Good evening, President Aragin, members of the board. Oh, oh, we good? Okay, okay. Good evening, President Aragin, members of the board, Superintendent Miranda, uh, Tina Dagnall, Assistant Interim Assistant Superintendent of Business, and Maria Amanda Sarabia, Director of Fiscal Services, Risk Management, and Benefits. Okay, um, tonight we are going to present the first interim financial report. And basically the purpose of this report is to really provide an update to all of our stakeholders as a, at a, as a um, for, oh, that's not our right presentation, um, a snapshot of the district's financial status as a, at a certain point in time. So this is the report shows our actuals through October 31st and our projections through June 30th. It updates our to our actual enrollment. It updates our multi-year projections and our cash balance, cash flow based on the latest information. Yeah, this isn't the right presentation, so I'm not sure. Okay. 
want to take a five minute recess? Okay, we're we're going to take a five minute recess. Okay, uh, so I want to share it with uh, uh, CJUSD for the exam. Okay. I'm confused. Is this what's on board? Is this going to be confusing? Yeah, this is it. It's not what's there. This is what's right. Right, that's not what, that's not the one. So it's something. Let me show you how. Okay, okay. Sounds good. So the right one is on board dogs. Oh, okay. That's what I wanted. Why? I'm so confused. Okay. Or at least the right one's on board. Mm -hmm. It is uh, 6.32 and we are going to reconvene our meeting.
Again, 5.0, administrative presentation. Item 5.1, first interim report and LCAP budget overviews for parents, business service division and education service division. And now we have our assistant superintendent and our uh, director uh, to, ready to present. Okay, so um, just to clarify what is online is the correct presentation. It just got the wrong one was just being shown up here. So. Um, as we were saying, we we're basically just providing all of our stakeholders a snapshot of the financial data as this uh, point in time. It's our actuals through October 31st, our projections through June 30th, and basically we just incorporate all of the revisions that we've seen from the 45-day revision until now with our enrollment and um, ADA, our multi-year projections, and our cash flow. So per, next slide please. Um, Per education code, um, the board must certify the first interim report that the financial projections meet one of the following, whether we can meet our financial obligations for the current and two subsequent fiscal years that we may not meet or we will not be able to meet. And based on the report that um, has been presented, that will be presented and that you have in your packet, we recommend that the board approve a positive certification stating that the district will meet its financial obligations for the current and subsequent two fiscal years. Next slide, please. Good evening, Board President Adeguin, Board Members, Superintendent Miranda, Executive Cabinet, staff members, and community members. It's my pleasure to be here tonight to report on the district's first interim. This slide shows the revenue changes since the 45-day revision which is an overall increase of 26.1 million. In LCFF, revenues have decreased by 6.4 million due to three factors, declining enrollment, a decrease in average daily attendance, ADA, and a decrease in the unduplicated pupil percentage, UPP. Historically, the district's ADA is just under 95%. However, our current ADA is at 89%. The district's UPP also decreased this year due to a low return rate on the alternative household income forms. These issues are not only affecting our district, but many districts throughout the state. In federal funding, there was an increase of 39.4 million due to ESSER funding and funding for the expanded learning grant ELOG. Initially, the ELOG was funded solely by state revenues. After the 45-day revision, the funding structure for ELOG changed, with a portion of the funding now coming from federal revenues. The decrease in state revenues seen here is due to the portion of ELOG funding that shifted from state to federal revenues. Next slide, please. As this pie chart illustrates, the district's main source of funding is LCFF revenue, which accounts for 69% of total general fund. Usually, LCFF revenue accounts for 80%, while federal revenue accounts for 6%. However, the district is receiving a greater portion of restricted, restricted federal funds to address pandemic-related needs. This is causing the portion of federal revenue to increase to 21% and the portion of LCFF revenue to decrease to 69%. State revenue makes up 7% of the district's funding, while local revenue accounts for 3%. Next slide, please. This slide shows expenditure changes since the 45-day revision. Overall expenditures increased by $35.2 million. The increase seen in books and supplies, other services and operating expenditures is due to one-time carryover and expenses covered by ESSER funds. We will be looking closely at expenses between now and second interim when we will have a better idea of the estimated actuals. Next slide, please. As this pie chart illustrates, salaries and benefits account for the biggest portion of district expenditures, followed by books and supplies at 18%, other services and operating expenses at 13%, capital outlay at 
and other outgo and inner fund transfers at one percentage. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned earlier, part of the interim report is our current year projections, but then also projecting out the next two subsequent fiscal years. So here we have a chart of the major assumptions that go into um, creating those multi-year projections. Of particular note is the enrollment. We can see a decrease each year of about 400 or about 2%. Um, we have our ADA, which we're seeing a decrease this year and an increase next year due to our projection of our actual percentage of enrollment to ADA. We're um, really anticipating that projection to go back up from about 90% to 95% next year, which is our, our average um, uh, percentage rate. You can see the estimated COLA current year 5.07, projected at 2.48 and then 3.11. When we get the January governor's budget, um, we probably will see a change here and we will update that accordingly. And then also of particular note is the pretty large increases in our SPURS and PERS employer contribution rates. That's a very big um, hit to our general fund budget as, um, as we see hitting uh, our, against our salaries too. This slide provides a look at the multi-year projections for the current year and the subsequent two years. In 22-23, there is a significant decrease in LCFF revenues because the relief provided by the 2021 ADA hold harmless expires. This means the district will experience two years worth of ADA loss in one year. Also in 21-22, we saw a super cola which decreases to average levels in 22-23. In 23-24, the COLA does increase, resulting in an increase to the LCFF funding. The multi-year also shows a decrease in federal revenue due to the expiration of one-time federal funds. In 22-23, there is a decrease in books and supplies, other services and operating expenses, and capital outlay due to the expiration of one-time federal funding and one-time carryover. Overall, the multi-year projects that the district will deficit spend in all three years. Next slide, please. This slide shows the components of the ending fund balance. 175,000 is set aside for non-spendables, followed by the 3% reserve for economic uncertainties and the restricted ending fund balance. Each year, there are also funds being allocated to offset deficit spending. In 21-22, there are funds being assigned for facility relocation costs and funds being committed for vehicle, vehicle and field replacement, future facility needs, LCAP carryover, unrestricted lottery, and future custodial support. Funds are also being committed in 22-23 for vehicle and field replacement and future custodial support. Next slide, please. So that is a lot of information and a lot of work compiled into a very few slides, um, but we do, the next upcoming events are um, the January, as I mentioned, the governor's budget workshop where we will see the projected, um, first look at the projected state budget. And then we will present a second interim report to you in March, March 15th. The governor will then update those January projections at the May revise in May. And then in June, we'll have the preliminary um, budget hearing and then the budget adoption at the last meeting in June. Next slide. So we'd be happy to take any questions from you right now. Questions from the board? Uh, uh, board member Pat Harrow? I have one question. Um, I, I think I know the answer, but I just want to make sure. Uh, for the enrollment for 22-23, we took into consideration uh, the normal normalization of all funds for uh, students. So that did not include potential students that we may lose to enrollment, um, depending on what the governor's mandate requires. No, it's just the current kind of trend that we see right now. 
So then, um, depending on the, if an event that were to come through, and depending on how what we do, um, is that something that would come into play when we review the budget uh, again the next time? I think we'd have to see any trend, new trends or new data that we've got, and we would incorporate that at that okay, point. Yes. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you. Board member Thorne Ojeda. Any other questions? Oh, yes, I do. Sorry, I don't have a button down here. Um, just if you could expand a little bit upon the um, the reduction in LCFF. You mentioned that that's kind of the whole harmless that will come to an end. And so you said it's two years worth of um, reduced revenue that we're going to experience all, all at once. And is that strictly tied to ADA, or is that um, is there some other other some other factors in that? Um, yes, that is um, mostly tied to ADA. Um, in 1920, um, the ADA that we had for that year, uh, we also used in 2021. So that was part of the hold harmless due to the effects of COVID. Um, so this year, because we are in declining enrollment, uh, our funding is still based on that ADA number from 1920 that was also used in 2021. So next year in 22-23, uh, we'll see the impact of two years worth of decrease in enrollment and as a result, decrease in ADA. Okay, so quick question. So for 21-22, which is the current school year, yes. did we projected a declining enrollment from previous year to this year? Yes, we did. And I thought, Mr. Dr. Miranda, I thought we actually had a small bump in increase in enrollment overall this, this academic year. I think uh, once the uh, final numbers came in, uh, sorry, I don't know when the feedback said. Yeah, uh, I think the final, the final numbers, as he said, uh, and, and I would have to look at the uh, Roman numbers. But overall, we, we had, uh, based on a projection, it was higher than that. Yeah. That's and that's the beginning of the year. Obviously, we have to yeah. see that smoothing effect throughout the year. But that, if that's something that you could, we make the adjustments obviously accordingly, right? As we see those numbers, because we're still in the middle of the year, so there could be some adjustments. There. Okay, so that that's it, it's it's a moving target. But uh, I do recall at the beginning of the school year, we talked about uh, a bit of a surprise and seeing an increase for the first time in in a little while. Yeah, and and these uh, enrollment projections also I'll just say that we don't uh, have, uh, for example, we do have uh, plant. Uh, homes in our in in mm -hmm. uh the, you know uh, build or developments rather yeah. uh so we don't have those factored in uh so we're we're not yet there because we want to make sure that those developments are happening so well and so uh, that'll offset some of the decrease and uh so uh, i'll just say that also i'll just add that uh sacramento uh there is legislation up there again to uh, because this is a statewide issue uh, in uh, the decline enrollment and ADA, the state recognizes uh, that uh, there is a big giant cliff on this uh, over the horizon next year. Uh, so there's legislation being put out at the state level uh, and it's getting a lot of traction right now on what they're gonna do, if they're, whether it's gonna be a three year uh, ADA rolling average or uh, funding based on enrollment. So I, I uh, uh, part of SANDEVS and executive committee on board, we are advocating for something, uh, to, you know, in terms of, and we're pushing more towards a rolling average. We think that's a better uh, solution to the issues we're having here uh, with uh, ADA. Uh, and so, uh, well, obviously, it's uh, we, we're going to wait to see what happens. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, the state recognizes that there's a, a huge loss of revenue for, for districts across the board because of of what's happened with, uh, uh, you know, this year with uh, uh, the independent study and and our students being in distance learning and so forth. So uh, to, to be, you know, that's why January for us uh, uh, is so critical and so important of what the governor is going to do. The, the good news is the, re the revenues and the budget looks positive. Uh, so uh, revenues, statewide revenues have outpaced uh, projections by significant amounts. So we expect uh, a good education budget 
I think I said enough already <laughs> on that, <laughs> but uh, so, so hopefully that helps a little bit. It does, it does. So for 22-23, when will, um, will the LCFF be uh, factored in, or calculated, I should say, based on ADA enrollment for that year? Is that what's going to happen, or is it the year prior? The year prior. The year prior. So because looking, we're declining. We're declining. Okay. So they'll... Uh, Depending on how we end this year, obviously that'll make an adjustment to next year's LCFF, unless there's a change in formula, which I know there's some talk you shared um, at the statewide level. And out of curiosity, just looking at the out year projection of ending fund balance, what was our fund balance um, at the end of last fiscal year? You want to call? For last fiscal year? Last fiscal year, yeah. Sorry, I know it wasn't in the chart, but. Year. No. I, I don't have the number handy, but if um, I could put it in board correspondence. If you would, and I would like to make a suggestion because I think this is just helpful because projections um, are helpful prospectively, but it also helps to see where we came from. And, and uh, certain agencies that I've worked with, you usually, you don't just get the current year and then in this case, the subsequent two, we uh, sometimes get the prior year. And that gives us a, a better idea of a trend. So if I could make that suggestion, and if the board is so inclined, that when we do see these projections, that we also perhaps do the previous fiscal year. So we see where did we end last year, here's where we are currently, and here's what we're projected in the out years. Because things change dramatically throughout the year. I, I, I think we have estimated a, a deficit um, in all now 10 years that I've been here, uh, yet we haven't always ended. With a deficit so and that's because funding changes when they revise comes in the economy changes so it helps right. to we see that trend a 76 million yeah. uh, surplus last year yeah. our ending fund balance okay so you're, you're absolutely right we have not ended with a, a deficit uh two years ago we ended with a slight surplus of about two million yeah before that so we we uh we do project worst case scenario Spending every single dollar, and and so, uh, but but you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, and the numbers will change, and, and we'll and we'll adjust. And I I believe in budgeting conservatively, but you don't want to um, hinder yourself from making certain investments uh, because we have to be able to adjust accordingly and um, make a reasonable. Um, I'll say take reasonable risks. I don't think they're really all that risky at times when we're making those longer term investments, whether it's in our staffing um, uh, or facilities or other resources. So yeah, it's understand and agree with conservative budgeting and being smart about it, but also not losing the opportunity to make investments when we have the money and the resources available. So, and I know our uh, labor folks are really helpful, helpful in helping us figure out how to spend that money, which is not a bad thing. <laughs> we work together on that. But we have a lot of needs in the district too. We talk about that great. So well, anyway, a lot of the a lot of the the funds that we see with one time money. Has yeah, to exactly. Work, that's great that have to be spent down yeah. over the years. So that's why you see the you know, state will then uh, come out and you know have asked for additional one time funding, and so those have to be spent down. Those are restricted funds. Sure. So that's why you see high balances, and now we're spending them down. Oops, that's why you see expenditures uh, significantly increase. Yeah, that's and that's true. And everything, all of that kind of falls into the fund balance. So you're right, there's colors of money and there's things that are in there that are earmarked for specific projects. The other thing that's not in here that uh, usually it's in the larger budget conversation, but it is helpful is particularly with staffing, you know, we, we have a vacancy um, and there's some salary savings from that. Although we budget to fill every position, the reality is we don't, we don't do that every year um, for a variety of reasons. I mean, there's turnover, there's a natural attrition that takes place. So um, getting a sense of that as we as we have presentations to know where where is that and where are we um, when it comes to things such as those vacancy rates for various positions. So, all right, that's that's it. Thank you. Any other questions? I have. Okay, board member Repo. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, ladies, for the report. And uh, my question revolves around our books and supplies. I noticed that in 2021 22. Uh, we have uh, almost uh, three fourths more revenue than we're going to have in the next two previous years. My question is that at this time, noticing that we do have that 
higher revenue, are we preparing to supply our teachers, our students uh, now with some of the, uh, the books and the supplies that they may need in order to offset the next two pre uh, years to come? Mr. I think I can answer that. Um, we don't have a textbook adoption scheduled next year, so we will, uh, we've adopted the last few years, so we don't have a major um, adoption scheduled for next year, so we will have, um, but we will supply the necessary textbooks for those that, that need our current adoptions. So I would assume, and correct me if I'm mistaken, that if uh, we do not utilize the majority of that funding, because it's quite a bit, it's almost three times the amount of the next two previous years, then it rolls over to the next year and we'll be able to utilize the monies that we don't use this year for the next two previous years. Yeah, we have a, a major math adoption coming up in the, in the next two years that, that um, we are um, working towards. Yeah, and yeah, I guess my, my idea is that the fact that uh, we just wanna make sure our students, our instructors get the needed books and supplies uh, Absolutely. In a timely manner. And, uh, you know, while we have the funding now, you know, maybe we, you know, I just was curious to see if we were looking at moving forward and in, uh, in supplying some, getting those supplies out. Yeah, I, um, I believe at this time, all of our um, textbooks are, all of our teachers have the correct textbooks and our students. And, um, Usually in March is when we order for the next year for any replacements or the lost or lost items. Okay, thank you. Thank you, ladies. Any other board members? Okay. Thank you, Superintendent, Assistant Superintendent Dagnald and uh, Director Sarabia. Thank you. Moving on to 6.0 action session uh, items. Items 6.1 through 6.44. Is anybody, uh, are any board members wanting to vote on something, on one of these separately? If not, I would like a motion to approve actions items 6.1 through 6.44. So moved. Or second. Down here. Either one. Oh, that would me, board member Flores. On a motion by board member Haro and second by board member Flores and carried on a, I'm sorry. Okay, um, we need to vote. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. I'm new at this. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Okay. And nays? Okay. On a motion by board member Haro, second by board member Flores, and carried on a 7 0 vote, the board approved action items 6.1 through 6.4. 6.44. Administrative reports, item 7.1, approved disbursements. We have item 7.2, uh, the annual um, Williams settlement visit. Item 7.3, uh, the annual Williams settlement visit. And this is for 2021 and 2021-22. Item 7.4, uh, approved change of order for the Colton High School cafeteria. Board resolution number 2155. Do, do we have any uh, questions on these? If not, okay, we're gonna move to item 7.5 facilities update. No update, correct? Item 7.6, ACE update. I would like to invite President Parachi to, pre to present. Good evening, board President Arikian, board members, Superintendent Dr. Miranda, and member of the audience. 
here we are at the end of 2021, and you probably don't understand anything I'm saying. My mask. <laughs> I can say anything I want. <laughs> what a year. We finished the first sem semester strong. Um, our teachers, our staff, um, our students, um, if you looked anywhere on social media, they were having a good time and they were all excited that it's done and over for three weeks. Um, our members are thankful um, to cabinet for uh, being able to work virtually tomorrow if they choose to. Um, I'd like to thank you um, board members, the three of you that were uh, that attended the meeting with Dr. Miranda to um, hear the concerns and questions that um, certificated staff has on COVID mandates. Now, um, it wouldn't be a board meeting if you don't hear about uh, negotiations. So um, we are done um, um, sunshining. Mr. Garcia is leaving. Mr. Uh, doctor, not doctor yet. Mr. Dade is taking over, so we are um, ready and excited to start negotiations. Uh, we, again, are asking that you send somebody at the table that can make a decision and sign documents. And I hope that the school board is giving the team parameters. Um, we are coming for a salary increase. I know we just had the budget uh, update. And um, our goal is to be done with negotiations for 2021, 2022 by May, 2022. Um, I would like to thank you and I wish you all uh, a Merry Christmas, Happy Holiday and Happy New Year and hoping and praying for a better 2022. Thank you for that. Item 7.7 .7, CSEA update. I would like to invite uh, CSEA representative Anthony Valderrama. Good evening again, uh, Anthony Guadarrama again, incoming president uh, starting January 1st. So I look forward to getting to know each and every one of you and working with all of you, Superintendent Miranda, executive cabinet, and uh, my fellow union uh, president to keep this district going in the strong direction that we are. And I really appreciate uh, action, by, action item 6.37, the summer assistance program. Uh, it was, uh, that is huge to my members. And I really appreciate district leadership, district leadership uh, deciding to participate in that program. Um, I know our 10 month, 10 month members are really gonna appreciate it. Uh, those two months during the summer were really tough. So again, really appreciative and um, just thank you very much. And. Happy holidays, Merry Christmas. Thank you, Anthony. Item 7.8, MAC update. There's no update, correct? Item 7.9, ROP update. No update. Moving on to 8.0, superintendents communicate. You got that right. I had sat up here for a long time, so I'm not used to the microphone here, but good evening, uh, Board President Aragin. Congratulations. And of course, uh, uh, our Vice, new Vice President, uh, Ms. Joanne Thornojeda, and our clerk, uh, Mr. Frankie Barra. Uh, uh, congratulations on that. I need to start off with that, and I could be, I would be remiss if I didn't thank uh, Board President Flores personally. Uh, as a new superintendent in my uh, second year, uh, his uh, leadership, his, um, and I'll say mentorship, uh, and his patience with me, I really appreciate that, uh, President Flores, or former President Flores for that. Uh, and, uh, you know, just uh, again, I, I want to thank you uh, for your, your uh, uh, support <clears throat> and uh, guidance. With that, uh, I'll start off with uh, Stuff the Bus. Uh, uh, so I'll tell you, uh, this is one of our shining bright spots in our district. Uh, Eric Richardson, director, uh, puts this together with his team. Uh, it's just amazing, uh, and it's something that has become um, just a, a staple of our district. Uh, so it's been making its rounds all over the uh, district. Uh, our transportation department painted uh, the holiday theme bus this year, collected donations of food, jackets, and toys from schools, and uh, in the district offices. So thank you 
all to your giving, you know, people that are giving at the, that time of year. Our student services staff uh, source them and deliver them to district families in, in the community. So just again, thank you to the Austin Transportation staff, uh, along with the student services for the, uh, the bus and for taking the time to bring smiles to many of our children and families. So uh, this, I was there today. If you saw my video on Instagram or Twitter, uh, thank you, Katie, for that. <laughs> you always uh, make me look better than, <laughs> than I am there. Uh, the next slide, please, uh, is our holiday reading initiative. I'm very excited about this because I know that uh, this is dear uh, and near to my heart, reading and to all of you and to all of our board members. Uh, so this is a statewide holiday reading initiative uh, that uh, it provides free access to thousands of digital books. Uh, so it's an incredible opportunity to our students, parents, please, if you're listening out there, uh, take an, uh, advantage. Uh, this initiative is going on now, uh, started December 1st and, and it will end January 31st. Uh, so this is a great opportunity for our parents uh, to keep your students engaged and entertained by reading free online news and literature throughout the holidays. So I know you're, you're on holiday break, but you got to read a little bit, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, the link is posted on the district social media feed. So uh, please get your read on out there, <laughs> uh, even during the break. Not I know video games, are, I'm going to play a lot of video games, but I'm still going to get uh, to reading. And last, uh, I'll end tonight. Uh, you know, we, we're coming into uh, the holiday break uh, tomorrow. Uh, our teachers uh, have, uh, have done an amazing job. Uh, they've dealt with a whole lot. Uh, so I want to thank the teachers. Uh, but I have to thank, uh, you know, this is kind of bittersweet, but I want to thank uh, our director of IT, uh, Mr. Shane Pinnell. Uh, tonight, uh, who is going to be leaving our district, uh, accepted a position outside the district. Uh, so I want to personally thank uh, Shane. Uh, he doesn't get the credit that's due. Uh, and, and so for everything he has done for the district, and, and it's a short time, it doesn't feel like a short time. It feels like you've been here forever, Shane, to be honest with you. Uh, so uh, you know, when I say that, I kind of say, no, no, he's been here for a long time. So when the district uh, had it switched to distance learning, uh, as you guys know, the infamous date back at March, what, 13th, Shane, or something like that. Uh, Shane led his department, let the chain, uh, chain, the change, uh, ensuring that every student had access to a device. Uh, Shane, uh, you're going to be missed uh, by your staff, by uh, me personally. I uh, wish you well, and I know you're going to continue to do great things uh, and, and make a, a, even a bigger impact. So. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity uh, <clears throat> to thank uh, and recognize uh, Derek Garcia, our Assistant Superintendent of HR. Uh, uh, and again, in a short period of time, uh, I mean, shorter than Shane, uh, <laughs> but he's made a positive, uh, uh, personally for me, impact on the cabinet and across the district. And so uh, all of your decisions uh, were always based on what is best for students. There was no doubt in my mind. Uh, as a 16-year special ed educator, teacher, uh, uh, you, you always had the best interest, student-centered, uh, and that's why uh, I hired you. And uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, Derek, uh, yeah, you're going to be missed uh, by all of us. Uh, we're especially going to miss your your uh, ugly uh, Christmas sweater. Uh, so uh, <laughs> that, that was pretty ugly, but it was awesome. And, and that just showed about showed your spirit uh, in about who you are and what you represent, because, you know, uh, uh, it, it just showed a lot about you. Uh, so I wish you uh, well in your next chapter. I want to say this publicly. Don't forget about Colton Joy Unifying. Uh, and uh, we, we appreciate uh, what, what you've done in a short period of time. HR is gonna, it's in great hands, in, in Mr. Dade's hands. Uh, moving forward, uh, you've left uh, some good foundations there. Thank you very much for, for everything you've done. And finally, uh, look, I'd just like to thank this, uh, uh, again, the, the, the community, the students. Uh, you made it to spring, oh, to, to winter break. <laughs> I was gonna say spring break, no, not yet there. 
Uh, and, and so I know they're all excited, waiting for uh, the gifts and, and, and all that. Parents, thank you so much for supporting us, uh, for getting us to this point. Staff, uh, again, staff, uh, not just uh, certificate staff, but our classified staff. I uh, just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, coming together for our students, uh, for uh, the community, uh, for coming together during these challenging times. Uh, and I want to wish everyone a happy holidays. Uh, and along, I think, along when I speak, I think I speak for the Board of Education, wish everyone a safe, healthy, and joyous holiday. Uh, and to please take time to rest uh, and to take care of yourself, get some uh, much needed rest uh, and self care, if you will, self care. Uh, our employees are are just uh, some of the most hardy, dedicated, and caring individuals uh, that go above and beyond. Uh, we're truly, truly our family here uh, at CJSD. I'm truly honored to serve as your superintendent. Uh, I'm, I'm humbled every single day with this opportunity. And again, um, just happy holidays uh, from from all of us up here. And um, with that, I will turn it over to you, to Board President Adigan. Thank you, Superintendent Miranda. Board member comments. Board member Ibarra. Thank you, Bertha. I'd like to start off by thanking Dan again for uh, his year as president. And as he probably will contest, it's, it's quite an experience sitting in that chair, but it's a good learning experience in many, many ways. So thank you for your professionalism, your dedication, and your leadership during this whole year. So wanted to say that. Also to Shane, I just wanna say thank you again, um, you know, for all the work you've done. Uh, you've made a wonderful impact here in our district. I just want to say I want to wish you the best in your new position and in, in life. So best wishes to you. And uh, to Derek, same thing. I'd like to uh, just thank you for the time that you've spent with us, um, your, your ideas, your thoughts. I know that there were, are some things that we probably could have implemented down the road that probably would help us and we're gonna miss your your creativity in, in those ways. So, but I uh, just wanna wish you well with your new career and your choices and your life as well. And to everybody here, I just wanna say thank you for this first semester. Wish everyone here uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays and uh, Happy New Year to all, and we'll see you next month. Thank you, Bertha. Thank you, Board Member Ibarra. Board Member Thoeing Ojeda. I'm going to start tonight. I mean, am I on? Um, one of the things that we talked about a lot lately is CJUSD care. I talked to Dr. Miranda about this today. When I saw the Williams report, I was really questioning CGSD cares. You know, over 20 years ago, we had, the Williams Act was approved in the state of California because so many places didn't have adequate materials, didn't have appropriate <clears throat> staffing. Um, and I know we have all that. But it appears to me that it hasn't become, it has become something that's not as important as it truly is. This is to protect our kids and it's to show that we really do care about kids, that we have sufficient materials, we are ready for them in the classroom each and every day. Looks like a place where kids come to learn. You know, so many of our children come from places that are not that desirable. And when they come to school, it should be a safe place and it should have all the things that they need. When I looked at the report, of all of our districts within San Bernardino County, you know, San Bernardino City has almost three times as many classrooms or spaces that they that visit. And yet we had more good repair needs than they did. <laughs> that says something to me that it's not taken real seriously. And it should be. We owe it to our kids 
We owe it to our teachers. Our staff needs to have classrooms that are ready every single day. Um, and I know Dr. Miranda says this is going to be a priority. It should have been a priority all along. We have the materials were there. We had sufficient materials, but you know, it doesn't take much for if a classroom teacher has something wrong in the classroom to send a quick note to somebody at the school who will take it seriously. It's like fix this door, fix this ceiling tile, something. And there's a system, there's a way we can make these things happen. So when kids go into a school, it looks nice, it looks clean, it's not in disrepair. That's a real big thing for me. And I, I really can't stress enough how I think it's important for kids to feel proud of their school and know that it's we care enough about ourselves and our school and our staff to do the right thing and to follow the Williams Act and to make sure that every single day we have what we need for all of our kids and all of our staff. And I, and I really want that to become a huge priority because it should have been for the past 20 years and it doesn't appear that it is what it should be. So I do care. <laughs> and I think this is a great district to be in and I want all of our kids, all of our staff to feel that way. Having said that, <laughs> um, I wish, I thank Dan for his leadership this last year. Um, during the pandemic, it's been very, very difficult as you all know. Um, Shane, I don't know how we did it, got you all this time with uh, our kids having classes and we have uh, technology um, meeting the needs that we couldn't have otherwise met, um, which it's frightening to me to think about how many of our little kids don't know how to read right now <laughs> and the things that we're going to have to do to really focus on instruction to get those kids because what I was said before, there's no do-overs and there's a lot that they didn't get because they just couldn't. And we need to do the very best and really move forward to make sure we do everything we possibly can for these little ones so that when they get to high school, they have reading skills for the content because it won't do them any good if they don't have those reading skills when they get there. Um, this board does care. I know that everyone on this board is here for that reason. And I know everyone out there. But we need to send the message to everyone that they're all part of this. And we all have to work hard to make sure that what we need every day we have. We have the money for it. We just have to have the interest and make sure those things happen. So, hi, Dr. Miranda, you promised me that it was going to get better. And um, it has to. And Shane and Eric, I wish the very best in your future endeavors. Don't forget us. We're doing good things for kids here. And um, I wish every single person in our district um, a holiday season that's happy and <laughs> take some time for yourself. And let's just hope and pray that the future is a little more bright than it's been for the past couple of years with the pandemic. But what we do each and every day in the classroom helps kids and people get through that as well. So we have to really strive to do the very best to give everybody what they need. Happy holidays, enjoy yourself, um, and make our kids have good holidays. Um, and that's it, thank you. Thank you, board member Thorin Ojeda. Board member Haro. For my point, but I'll try to get I have um, try to get through this. First of all, I want to uh, welcome Anthony Valderrama uh, to our board meeting and welcome the um, PSBA president. Uh, we look forward as a district and a board working with you, and so thank you for being here this evening. Um, I want to uh, I want to bring up a program. And it's not too late. I know it's the day before the last day of school, but it's not too late to participate. Um, Bloomington High School and, their, and uh, their admin staff did a program this year called BHS Winter Wishes. And what they did was they asked students what they wished for this holiday season. And they did have a Google Drive that says different items, questions. 
to the answer. And um, they had it categorized uh, as far as what clothing and toys, of course. And I just, it breaks my heart to read some of these because some of these kids are asking just for a new pair of shoes to wear. And that's something that we need to do better. I know we have our closet, but we need to reach out to these students. A lot of them ask for a gift card, a $10 gift card so they could give it to their mother to say thank you for putting food on the table. They asked for Stater Brothers gift cards so that their family could be fed. These are the students that we're serving. And um, there were so many different things. Um, one student wanted a gift card to Bath and Body Works so he could treat his mom to doing something nice for herself instead of always doing something for the kids. Um, one kid needs a new pair of basketball shoes because he won't be able to play basketball this Super Blue weekend because his shoes are falling apart. So um, there's a whole list, but what they're really looking at, you know, I know it's hard to right now, obviously go out and buy a pair of shoes by tomorrow, but they're asking for gift cards for these kids. Um, $10 gift cards to be donated and they can be also be done electronically. And so I just wanted to bring up this program because when I started looking at the Google Docs and the things that these kids were asking for, if you look at the list, there's hundreds of requests. They, most of them were not asking for themselves. There were a few, um, but most of them were asking for others, um, for others in their family to take care of their family. So I just wanted to bring up this program um, and if anyone can help. I think it was a, a wonderful gesture by Ms. Roman and her staff to do this for these kids. And when you read the list, it's really heartbreaking. Um, last year, when we were going to celebrate New Year's Eve, we hoped and prayed that 2021 would be a better year because 2020, let's face it, it sucked. <laughs> it was, it was, um, something all of us had never been through. It was horrible. And I don't think 2021 has been much better. So I know that this New Year's that we all hope that 2022 will be a better year again. I ask that when you have your celebrations with your family, it'll be sweet. Not just for yourself, but the others that you celebrate with. I ask that you remember the people, as of yesterday, 800,000 people who have died due to, due to COVID. Those are family members of someone and they won't be there this Christmas to celebrate. I have too many people close to me personally who passed this year because of COVID. And I know that on, on Christmas, I will be thinking of them. So I ask that you also think of people, not only within your own family, but pray for those people who give these people uh, to this horrible pandemic. Um, my quote this evening, it's not a holiday quote, although I do wish each and every one of you um, a very blessed Christmas. Because if we're sitting here or we're working in this district, we are blessed to have a job. We are blessed to have a roof over our head. But during this pandemic, most importantly, we are blessed to have our health. So I wish you all a very blessed Christmas, a happy New Year. Please take time to rest. Because as we know, once we hit second semester, for some reason, it just flies by. It goes by so quickly. And so we need to rest up for that second semester. My quote is, 
um, we recently lost, and, and I'm not being political or whatsoever, but we recently lost uh, Bob Dole. And at uh, his funeral, uh, Tom Hanks spoke, and I saw this on the news, and I didn't realize that uh, what Tom Hanks spoke about his work with Bob Dole in getting the World War II Museum, uh, World War II, um, uh, in Washington, D.C. And he did that because of his involvement in saving Private Ryan and wanting to honor those who had sacrificed so much for our freedom. And he read a quote that Bob Dole said, and it's my quote tonight. Speak straight, even when it gets you in trouble, because it will. And I know that firsthand, but at least everyone will know how you stand and what you stand for. And always plan not just to win, but win big. You may try and fail, but you will not fail to try. We have a lot of work ahead of us in the new year, but we will not fail and we will not stop trying. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member Harrell. Board Member Flores. Thank you. I want to thank everybody again, obviously, for a, a productive meeting, a good meeting, um, lots of discussion, obviously. Uh, and once again, I, I appreciate the public comments and the opportunity to have a, a dialogue, which I think is important. I want to thank Ms. Paraci for the opportunity to speak with some of our ACE members about their concerns. I thought that was constructive. Um, it was, uh, you know, it was meaningful and it was respectful and professional and there are real issues there. So there certainly is a discussion to be had at times on certain issues. You know, but facts obviously matter. Um, and having said that, um, you know, the internet's a wonderful thing, right? Um, I admit, I did a little Googling uh, right now uh, with respect to this article we received from one of the speakers, I think was a teacher. Um, this was issued on September 21st, uh, citing the Canada, Canada's University of Ottawa Heart Institute's study about the occurrence of uh, uh, mitocarditis and other related heart conditions. So this article was apparently made public on the 21st. By September 23rd, uh, the authors actually retracted the article. Um, CBC News, which is basically the BBC version uh, in Canada, ran an article um, and literally it states that uh, we recalculated the rate. This is a quote from one of the authors. We recalculated the rate and the rate is not correct in that paper said Dr. Peter Lu, scientific director of the Ottawa Heart Institute and co-author of the study. We were doing this on the run in a way and we were getting kind of preliminary vaccination rate data and so it turns out that number was not complete. Dr. Andrew Crean, co-director of the cardiac MRI service at the Ottawa Institute uh, confirmed that they were retracting this. In order to avoid misleading either colleagues or the general public and press, we the authors unanimously wish to withdraw this paper on the grounds of incorrect incidence data. We thank the many peer reviewers who went out of their way to contact us and point out our error. We apologize to anyone who may have been upset or disturbed by the report. It's probably an understatement. So, um, probably doesn't need to be stated, but you really you be careful of what you find on the internet. You probably shouldn't believe everything that's posted, but I think it's an interesting exercise in, uh, as we go through this process, and there's lots of facts and information to be thrown around, but um, let's keep in mind that, you know, if you're going to bring information to the table, let's make sure it's vetted, it's from credible sources, and, and that ultimately it's something that stands the test of whether or not it is true or accurate. Um, and again, in many of these conversations, we have lots of information being shared, but not all of it is entirely accurate. And I hope both sides, myself included, I am open to um, making sure that things are being vetted, that facts are correct. Uh, we've heard lots about what other districts are doing. Um, but as I have myself gone and researched these resolutions or letters or statements, uh, come to find there are very few, if any, districts uh, that are doing things differently. Um, there is no district that we are aware of that is actively defying the existing current mandate when it comes to uh, the requirement for staff to be vaccinated or test, for example. 
uh, yet we hear that there's all these districts that are doing just that. So I don't say that to be argumentative, more than anything to try to set the tone, particularly as an institution of learning, as we teach our children to research, vet, think critically, ask questions. This is really actually a, a brilliant exercise for our students to be able to go through that process and learn how to think critically. Um, and most importantly, vet sources. Most of us probably didn't have the internet as a, re as a resource or a source when we were going through school. We actually had to comb through encyclopedias and newspaper articles. But the advantage of that is most things didn't make their way into the encyclopedia or newspaper article that weren't already vetted. We don't have that uh, benefit with the internet. And so uh, it's a new way of teaching our students how to, again, ask critical questions, vet your sources, and make sure that what you're reading uh, has some validity to it. And that certainly includes where it's coming from. And if you go to the internet searching for something you're looking for, you're likely to find it, including somebody validating your opinion whether it's truthful or not. So um, I'll, I'll end with that. I just thought that was interesting. And again, I, but what I appreciate is the honest dialogue and the conversation about concerns, questions, and what we can do um, with respect to our employees in particular, and of course, with our students. So with that, I wanna thank everybody for being here and have a great holiday. Christmas is right around the corner and the new year. So God bless. Thank you, board member Flores. Board member Fuentes. Thank you, Board President. Uh, I think Dan, uh, again, thank you. Thank you for your leadership and uh, to our Vice President and our clerk also, thank you very much, uh, the prior leadership. And congratulations to our new leadership. Uh, congratulations to you. Also wanted to congratulate Anthony, uh, CSEA. Congratulations in your position also. Uh, we'll be ready to work with you and get together and get to, get to know each other. Also wanted to say, we're gonna miss you guys, Derek and Shane. We're gonna miss both of you. In the time that you've been here with uh, CJSD, you did ha you have an impact uh, with our district. And uh, I wanna thank you for, for your leadership and your work and uh, much appreciated, thank you. And I just wanted to, just final words is have a great Christmas, have a Feliz Navidad, Prospero Año, and uh, enjoy your time with your family. Last year really sucked, I'll be honest with you. It was a sucky year uh, for Christmas. You know, we didn't get to see family members and stuff. And even though we were together with our own families, but this year, take advantage of that. Take advantage of being with your familias. Uh, the key to the success in a family is when you gather, when you get together and you, and, and you remember those family members. And I think uh, Ms. Haro mentioned that, remembering our family members. Mom and dad, grandpa, grandma, even those uh, that were, you know, lost uh, during this pandemic. Let's remember them. Let's bring them up. We did lose some teachers in our district. We did lose some students. We did lose uh, many uh, families, lost a lot of people. And uh, let's remember them. And I think Ms. Haro had a great point there. And I appreciate her words. I appreciate her quote also. You know, I appreciate that quote. And uh, once again, have a great Christmas. Enjoy your time. Feliz Navidad. God bless you. Thank you, Board Member Fuentes. Board Member Sandoval. Um, Shane and Derek, um, congratulations to both of you. We're gonna miss you both. And to every parents, family, staff, teachers, happy holidays and enjoy your family this year and happy new year. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, board member Sandoval. Okay, um, I would like to just echo what uh, Pat Haro um, shared about uh, at Bloomington High School. I had the opportunity to go to Grand Terrace High School when they were actually passing out these gifts to uh, the, the students. And it was just, uh, I even got to, you know, take pictures with the kids. And uh, it, it's an awesome, awesome program that they have with this Make-A-Wish. There was a, a young man, uh, and it's true, they, they 
a lot of them wasn't for themselves. Um, it was for their family or friends that they knew needed something. There was a, a, a boy that that he, he did want something for himself. He wanted a bedspread. He said he wants a bedspread more appropriate for a teenage boy because he shares a room with his sister and he's surrounded by unicorns. And so, <laughs> so somebody, one of the teachers, did get him a, a bedspread, uh, and uh, so now he has his his own bedspread and his own theme in his corner. Um, okay, and I just want to say that um, I want to thank the board members for this nomination tonight. Um, it's an honor to serve as your board president. I'm looking forward to a, a better year and exciting things happening. Um, I think some of you know I was a student here in, in the district. I attended Wilson Elementary School and Zimmerman Elementary School. Um, then I, you know, I was a classified employee at Colton High School as an instructional aide. Um, then I was a teacher at um, at Lincoln Elementary School, and then I was a principal, um, assistant principal, and a principal at at Zimmerman and um, and Bernie. And then I was a director of language sports services, and uh, I retired and I came back as a board member. And now it's a, such an honor to. Oh, let me back up. My both my children. Came, I was a parent, so both my children graduated from our schools, and uh, I had grandchildren that came through. So I think I've basically filled it. I can wear every hat, and uh, today is just a highlight for me, um, and it's it's a true honor. Thank you for your nomination. Um, I would like to um, just wish our parents, our students, and our staff. A wonderful holiday season, and uh, I say parents, students, and staff, aka our CJUSD family. I'm wishing every single one of you a happy, safe, and joyous holiday season. With that, we're going to uh, go to closed session.
data to uphold the expulsion orders as presented. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And nays opposed? Okay. So motion passed. Yes. What is it? On a five one vote with Mr. Fuentes. Six oh. Yes, six. Uh six oh on this. On a six oh vote. Okay. Eleven point two. Personnel, public employee, on a motion by board member Flores and second by board member Thoring Ojeda, the board approved the following. On a six zero vote. Yeah. On a motion of board member Flores and second by Thoring Ojeda. Okay. My apologies. On a motion by board member Flores and second by board member Thoring Ojeda, the board approved the following. Person up, public employee, uh, let's see, certificated regular staff, uh, band teacher Ruth O'Harris Middle School, CTE business teacher Bloomington High School, elementary teacher Cooley Ranch, elementary teacher Richie Canyon, social science teacher Terrace Hills Middle School. Classified Management, Communication Specialist, District Office, Certified Certificated Coach, Head Varsity, Cross Country, Classified Coaches, Choir Accompanist, Co-Ed, Head Fresh Soft Baseball, Boys, Head Junior Varsity Basketball Girls, Head Junior Varsity Soccer Boys, Head Junior Varsity Softball Girls, Head Varsity Baseball Boys, Head Varsity Basketball Boys, Head Varsity Basketball Girls, Head Varsity Softball Girls, Head Varsity Tennis Boys, Volunteer Coaches, Soccer Boys, Soccer Girls 2, and Wrestling Co-Ed, and Volunteers 9. Item 11.3, in closed session on a motion of board member Ibarra, and second by board member Sandoval. And on a 5-1 vote with, uh, with board member Haro descending, the board appointed jo Joda Murphy, Director of School Improvement and Accountability. Fuentes is absent. With that. Yes, the ID numbers for the students are 1045 Okay. Okay. With that, we are going to adjourn at 941. Happy holidays, everyone, and drives home safely. <laughs>